Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. I'm your host, Brian Cahoot from HJ Wealth Management. My co-host is Patricia Dunn from Merrill Lynch. Um, our special guest is Jeff Stolman from Rocky Mountain Tech Marketing. Um, we're glad you joined us. We have a great show. Pat, great to see you. Good to see um, you again. We always warn the viewers not to time this because the show is taped. But with that said, um, the market's been volatile. We probably would say this for the last couple of years. I mean, you know, the last quarter we had this kind of 10% down and a full circle. Um, we just mentioned the market had just gone positive. So what do you see? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. It took till the 1st of April to actually get the Dow and the NASDAQ into positive territory. And since then, it's been pretty strong, at least at this point in the, in the month. So we're hoping that it'll continue. But we have had two quarters in a row of contracting S&P earnings. When they finalize the first quarter earnings, they think that they will also be negative, And they're not holding out much hope for second quarter earnings. Everything's being pinned on the second half of the year. Right. But if the market's behavior so far in April is any indication, they might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, the, the R word's been thrown out, recession. And I think to your point, you know, people have said, well, we're in an earnings recession because of the earnings dropped in the last two quarters. Do you think we're headed into an economic recession or? Actually, no. Um, this has been mostly around energy and a few other related industries like manufacturing and materials. But the United States economy is actually in much better shape than the rest of the world. So um, really, the positives regarding our economy outweigh the negatives. So we do not see a recession. So do you, are you telling from an asset allocation perspective, are you having clients overweight U.S. or? Yes, and interestingly enough, um, not to rule out international. And in the last couple of weeks, uh, the emerging markets yeah. have started raising <laughs> so their heads. To them, right? Yes, finally. <laughs> finally. <laughs> <All> right, so. <laughs> so I'm not um, underweighting uh, international. It has its place. Maybe the next one up to bat. Yeah, it's been an underperformer. So you know, as as the reversion to the mean, people believe it's probably its time in the sun is about to come. So it, you know, mm -hmm. just when people are ready to give up on it, is probably the wrong time to do that. So. I know we're both proponents of asset allocation, kind of stick to it, um, and that's probably still the case. Um, unfortunately, I guess we ha haven't been able for the last couple of years not to talk about oil. Um, you know, oil's kind of in this trading range, and you know, people are making cases that it's going to go back down to twenty-five dollars, and then there's the case that it's going to go back to eighty. <laughs> um, what's what's Merrill Lynch's outlook or your outlook? Um, I'm not going to touch that <laughs> way. <laughs> way. Right, exactly. But the the result of this, um, what we really thought was that with the lower oil prices that this would spur consumer spending. It hasn't happened, right? So, no. So what are they doing with that? They're saving it, which yeah. actually is good in the long run yeah. because the debt levels in this country are way too high. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we have aging baby boomers approaching retirement, and many of them haven't found themselves in a position to be able to afford to save. So maybe these lower or oil prices is actually helping them save for retirement. Let's hope so. Let's hope so, exactly. So. Yeah, you know, the other other issue out there that gets a lot of press is the student loan, what people are referring to as a bubble. Um, you think there's any way out of it? I mean, how do we solve solve that problem? That is a huge problem, and I'm not so sure the government's solution to just forgive all those <laughs> loans is necessarily right. the right answer. Right. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Um, that is probably the next shoe to drop. Yeah, it's is scary. Uh, what do we do with all these loans? Because the kids getting out of college. They say, as a rule of thumb, you should only borrow as much as you think you're going to earn in salary your first year out of college. And I think that's a good rule of thumb, but I don't think that has been followed. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the problem is, you know, college is a competitive business, right? And they're trying to get students in through the program, and no one's sitting there saying, well, the debt you're taking on is going to match the major you took, and you, you know, have no way to, you know, support that debt load. Exactly. Uh, Exactly, and then it may fall back on mom and dad. Yeah, so it's interesting. So, um, you know, interest rates. I mean, I get, you know, also another topic for years that we say, well, rates are going to go up. They got to go up. They're <laughs> going to eventually go up, and you know, one of these days we'll be right, I guess. Um, you know, so the Federal Reserve last year raised rates. They got a lot of negative press for doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, seems like they're willing to sit a little tighter this year and not be that aggressive. You know, what's your outlook? I mean, it's putting savers 
And retirees in a bad spot because yields are almost impossible to come by. Absolutely. Uh, it is hurting the saver right now. And you're starting to see products come out that uh, are cash alternatives or bond alternatives or complements to a bond fund. Um, so uh, the industry is starting to respond to this, but you're absolutely right. And I think because of this, the Fed has to raise rates. Yep. It's when are they going to do it? Right. And we're hoping that go we get one or two more raises before the end of this year. Yeah. But I'm beginning to think it's going to be more like the second half than the second quarter. Seems that way, right? So yeah. I guess the next bite of the apple's June, so we'll see what they do here. But um, yeah. Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, you know, obviously the banks are dying for them to raise rates um, because they've been under pressure. But yeah, um, I get scared when clients start reaching for yield, right? Because yes. You know, if uh, they don't reach the right way. Right. They could be in for a nasty surprise. Exactly. Right? I, unfortunately, I think a lot of them learned it with a lot of the MLPs that had nice yields, mm -hmm. and obviously they were tied to the energy sector that you know wasn't sustainable. So, you know, I think we tell our clients all the time, risk and return come together. So, if someone's offering you a high yield, it's coming at a price. It's right? coming at a price. <laughs> it's, 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 so, no, know what you're getting you know into. Know what you're getting in. Eyes wide open. So, um, Pat, you have time for a question? Yeah. Um, so Mark Byers from Chester Springs is asked, what is the Internet of Things and what are some companies in this area? Very good question, and it speaks right to our guest uh, yeah, well, in today's show. Things, so we're going to have more on it. But the Internet of Things is the technology behind connecting things to your mobile, like your phone, and broadband. Um, it's a growth area, definitely a growth area, and I can't wait to interview our guests today to find out even more about that. Companies that are participating in this area include Apple and Google and IBM, and then some that you wouldn't think of right away, like Medtronics, Johnson & Johnson, AT&T, Verizon, because of course they have to carry it. Now, understand I'm not making any recommendations here uh, the question was, what are some companies participating? And I'm answering that question, but I'm not making any recommendations. Before you venture into this area, I would suggest you check with your professional financial advisor who knows your risk tolerance and your time horizon and ultimately your goals. And they'll be able to tell you whether an investment in this area is suitable for you or not. Right, and you know what we like to warn clients and viewers all the time is, a great company doesn't always make a great stock, right? Exactly. So do your homework, talk to the professional, go in and make an educated decision before you go invest. So um, great answer. Um, if you have a question, here's how you send it into Money Matters. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com welcome back now it's time to introduce our special guest jeff stolman from um, rocky mountain tech marketing welcome to the show jeff um Thanks very i guess much first i know you have a pretty broad array of experience tell us what you do uh, you know what what's rocky mountain all about and you know well we're basically a consultancy but but we also do a lot of uh invention and we cross a, a variety of technologies for a variety of industry sectors um, it's kind of anything that's interesting, legal, and ethical. <laughs> is it all you? We'll tackle. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, part of the big part of that is being a thought leader. Yes. Can you explain to uh, our audience just what it means to be a thought leader? Well, my definition, which is possibly self-serving, is is people tend to get in a routine of thinking a certain way if they're doing the same thing all the time, and to me, it's a matter of being able to frame the problem correctly. That's usually the first failure that people have. And if you're always looking at, at uh, a problem a certain way, you often miss the opportunity to find a new way to do something. And 
I myself am a polymath, so I've I was to say, work in a variety of fields and I work across a variety of industries, so oftentimes I'm able to see that there's a much better way to frame the problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example is, is I just received an RFP this week where a company wanted to improve their customer facing uh, touch points. So they were looking, they, they wanted someone to propose a technology to improve their customer facing touch points. But that was pretty much the extent of their RFP. They gave a couple suggested technologies. But they really never defined what those touch points are, what the metrics are that they want to use to measure them, why it has to be a technology a solution. It could be a process solution or a people solution. And they're missing out on a lot of opportunities just because they're think, they think it has to be a technology solution. It may well be, but it, it's just a little too open-ended and it doesn't at, at the same time restrictive because they're not really, they don't really articulate the problem very effectively. So one, once you solve the problem of defining it, <laughs> the solutions come a lot easier. I mean, Al Albert right. Einstein said, you know, you can't solve a problem with the same mind you use to create it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So, so you alluded to it in, in that answer about mm -hmm. disruptive technologies. You know, you think mm -hmm. of like Uber and mm -hmm. maybe what Elon Musk is doing. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you see some disruptive technologies out there that are probably change? Yeah, the well, I'm three three big ones that are getting a lot of play and for good reason. I would say would be blockchain technology, uh, the Internet of Things, which is one of your viewers had the question on. Um, and artificial intelligence. I mean, there's a lot more, but right. we have limited time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. I don't, I'm not familiar with the term blockchain <coughs> technology. Can you explain what that is? Yes. Uh, most people don't have any clue what blockchain technology is, but most people have heard of Bitcoin. Yes. Okay. Bitcoin is, is kind of the killer app, or at least not really the killer app, the first application using blockchain. It's a technology that allows you to create a non-repudiatable transaction log. And once you have a non-repudiatable transaction log, you can apply that across a variety of industries. The financial industry right now, every major bank is investing millions of dollars in this. I'm talking about Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, uh, Credit Suisse, UBS. And they're all looking at this because they think it's going to be the basis for clearing of Current, okay. current, current items, but also things like bonds and derivatives that don't really have an organized market, because it's fast and it's cheap, and you can transfer money. Bitcoin people who already use Bitcoin will know that if you want to, you know, send a foreign, a remit, foreign remittances instead of going to Western Union and paying, you know, fifteen dollars to send fifty, you know, you can pay a buck or you know some small amount, and the currency translation to the other country kind of happens automatically. You buy up some bitcoins, you transfer the bitcoins to somebody else, they cash them in whatever country they're in, and they get the local currency. And the, and the transaction fees are very small. That's why, you know, <coughs> when it first came out, you heard a lot of people saying it's interesting from a payment processing perspective, mm -hmm. maybe not a currency, and I guess that's mm -hmm. what you're really referring to is yes. it may change the way things are processed. and. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's dramatic. I mean, as I say, the financial services industry is, is really glomming onto that they recognize very quickly how important this can be for their industry because there's so many transactions that take right. place and that can take place very rapidly. But we're applying it right now. We're developing a solution for the pharmaceutical industry where there's a requirement, a, a legal requirement. That there's something called the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, which is a way to try to detect counterfeit products, gray market products, diluted products in the market because it's not only a public health problem, it's also costing the industry billions of dollars every year. And by 2023, they have to have a solution in place. And this is kind of an ideal solution because it's because you have this non-repudiatable transaction log, you can track the ownership of a product from the manufacturer to the distributor to the, pardon me, to the dispenser. And if a distributor buys 50 cases of X and he sells 51, okay. we'll know it. <laughs> and the whole basis of Bitcoin is one of the key features of the blockchain is it will keep you from double spending. So where that 50 first came from, you know, whether it's a counterfeit or he diluted the first 50 to make a 51st, 
we don't we can't tell that all we know is that this is the guy who did the suspicious transaction and then forensic analysis will have to be you know brought in but so it's a software that does this it, it's it? in software yes it, I mean blockchain is actually kind of a suite of different software techniques and includes encryption which is why it helps keep it non repudiatable mm -hmm. um, and it also uses various uh, approaches to get consensus so that what goes into it has already been confirmed as being accurate and true. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very good technique for, and it, it can be applied to a lot of things. But another area we looked applying it into is the maritime fuel industry where they have to meet environmental regulations as to how much sulfur is in their fuel. And uh, it's very expensive given the n large number of ships and the vastness of the oceans. You can't uh -huh. just sit there with a stack monitor because no one's going to spend the money on those. But we can just track it from the refinery, how much sulfur's in the fuel. We know how much they're buying. We know how much they're using. Because there's two different standards depending on whether you're in open ocean or you're like along the coast of the US or Europe. And we can kind of impute how much they need and figure out if somebody's cheating. Because all the big companies obey the law, but they're losing millions of dollars to the small guys who have <laughs> very little <laughs> reputational risk. Right, they're, right. they're known as cheap, you know. <laughs> right, right. So and it's a problem. Yeah, you know, we touched on the Internet of Things. Um, you know, we had a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, one of the areas you you said you right. have. Um, well, what do you see? Um, I don't, I'm not sure everyone even understands what that. I, they hear the term, but I'm not sure they even understand what exactly is right. going on in there and and how you see it changing right. um, the future. Well, as, as Pat alluded, it's it's basically taking devices and connecting them to pretty much to the Internet, so that devices can now talk to each other, not just be there for a person and so you know people where you hear of Fitbits which you wear it around your wrist it reports through your smartphone and tells you how much you've walked today maybe how many calories you burned, what your temperature you know various devices will give you a lot of health metrics and those are those are getting a lot of public press mm -hmm. as consumer I consumer items but to some extent there's just a lot of novelty in them and a lot of Fitbits end up on the shelf after people have had them for several weeks but in the enterprise, uh, they're making a very big difference. Uh, you can now start instrumenting things like pipelines, where you can have instruments all along the way that are reporting back uh, using some radio frequency. They can be reporting back through a cell phone network. We uh, built a solution for the electric utility industry where we instrument every single power pole to determine if that pole is tilting and maybe about to fall, or one of the cross arms is tilting and about to fall. Uh, as well as where the cr is their current at that pole. So when there's a d an outage, rather than having to drive up and down miles and miles of roads looking for the where, where the outage started and where the problem is, we will know exactly which pole is the problem and where the problem is. So, so if it's about to fall, they get so somebody gets presumably some kind of text message saying this pole and this. That's correct. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they'll basically have a. Uh, you know, a, a screen that kind of gives them status, you know, some kind of diagnostic screen, depending on what they want, how they want to arrange that. Uh, I can see this could be incredible <coughs> with like a Katrina or some other big natural disaster. Absolutely. I mean, you can now just, you know, put weather instruments out. They're very one of the one of the things that's making the Internet of Things happen is that the instruments themselves are now very small and very cheap and the communication bandwidth has gotten you know increasingly inexpensive so you can you know put out a slew of these sensors of, of different types of sensors and you can see a storm coming you can you know put some stuff out on the ocean and spot a tsunami <laughs> <laughs> before it happens wow, wow. you know it's there's, there's there's the applications are are kind of mind-boggling and, and the different ways you could you know potentially apply this well, that leads to mm -hmm. the next question. If we have all of these Internet of Things interconnected, we can't be far away from the concept of artificial intelligence. Would you speak to that? Uh, yeah, artificial intelligence is, is another very important area. And one, one of the things that um, we're able to do is now with, with all these sensors, we can start making sense of the data. I mean, data are just data until they become information, and artificial intelligence is very good in translating data into usable information. So the whole notion of 
drivable cars or even in current cars that people have you know backup sensors and an alarm will go off because the sensor not only do you see the picture possibly on a screen but the sensor knows that you're within three feet of an object and it'll get louder as you get closer and the art it's artificial intelligence that's allowing this picture to be translated into distances that's you know doing the calculation um, there's uh, in the driverless car obviously there's there's even more mm -hmm. requirement for artificial intelligence uh, one of the issues is kind of wh what's the rule set right mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not a technical issue it's a political issue but I mean you have the problem of if there's a car that's uh, you know gone haywire do you want it to kill one person to avoid s six <laughs> Right, well, yeah. <laughs> and who's going to make that decision? You know that decision is going to be programmed in if, if that car is driving. But while that while that's a, that, that's kind of at the fringe, some of the issues that people will have to solve the ability to then have disabled people, older people, mm -hmm. intoxicated people, mm -hmm. uh, using driverless cars, uh, independent of the of kind of the loss of anxiety now the less stress of having to sit there in traffic you just you know go about your business sit on your laptop and right. peck around while the car gets there and the fact that it takes a little longer because the car was going slow to avoid a traffic jam is uh, <laughs> becomes less of a problem it's right. gonna leave the driving to us <laughs> yes yes so um, you know, our, our, our viewers are you know here as investment ideas wh wh who mm -hmm. do you see some of the winners of, of these technology internet of things or a, you know artificial intelligence well it, it that's that's a, a really interesting co pro problem because there are kind of two different types of companies that are approaching this a lot of the large companies as pat mentioned you know you have people in the internet of things like ibms and stuff like that right, and they have Watson, cisco right? <laughs> so. yeah and yeah those those companies certainly will benefit from their investments but because they're not pure plays and they're quite diversified I think with the exception of IBM because they're trying to make that almost their mainstream yeah. next business but I'm not an investment advisor so uh, <laughs> but so you have these l very large companies that that have you know potential to make a lot of money it's a matter of whether how that you know tips the balance given their diversification and then you have a lot of small players many of whom will fail a large number of whom, however, will get bought out, right. mm -hmm. but most of those will happen before they're public companies. So if you're not an angel investor or you aren't part of a venture capital fund, it becomes a little bit hard to pick those people. Right. Right. Uh, but you're going to, you do have, you know, some small, some companies will be successful at a certain level and then they'll eventually get bought out and, you know, it will be possible for the public to be able to participate. Right. But th I mean, 3D <laughs> printing was getting all the press for a while, mm -hmm. and you haven't heard much. You know, is it, I mean, is it still viable or, or you know? Three, yeah, 3D printing, again, most of these disruptive technologies are really making the difference in the enterprise. And when they're in the enterprise, they're kind of under the radar of the public, so people don't see them. But the changes that are being made, uh, just the idea of being able to make s replacement parts kind of on the spot. Uh, and imagine something imagine you're in the army and you're in some war zone and some vehicle fails and needs a part if you have a 3d printer and can print up a part to spec and put it in there rather than wait for it to get pulled from a from a warehouse in the u.s put on a plane you know maybe two or three different planes in transit or a ship it can take a long time to get there so the maintenance industry is is an area that could really will really benefit from that but also the idea, ability to prototype new parts before you get into an expensive manufacturing process where you basically can design something with CAD software, right. computer-aided mm -hmm. design mm -hmm. software, and just plug that into a 3D printer and make the part. And there are 3D printers now that will, you know, it used to be the original ones were some kind of waxy plastic, yeah. but now there's metal, there's all, a, a wide variety of different materials that have, you know, obviously different strength properties, different, uh, stiffness property so you can make a lot of different parts it's not just a matter of creating a shape it's creating a usable part that will stand the stress and strain of whatever its operation is do you see a day where it will be in every house a 3d printer 
Uh, I don't know that people will uh, will need them individually. <laughs> I think it could be something like Kinkos, right, you know, you and maybe what you do if you're you're designing something at home and then you just send it to them and print it out and go pick it up. Uh, it depends on how large. One of the issues with with three D printing is really one of scale. That three D printers get very expensive as you start making larger and larger parts. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, you know, tinker at home with a little thing, and if that's all you need, that's fine. But if you happen to want to make a picture frame mm -hmm. for an odd shape, boat, you know, picture, <laughs> some painting that somebody made that was octagonal, you could very quickly do that. Now you are Jeff. You are also an inventor. Yes. And I know you have at least one patent. Can you tell us what uh, you have a patent for? Well, actually, yeah, I have several patents. Uh, one, one is actually for a financial instrument. It's, uh, as you may be aware, that there's a kind of niche market for leveraged index ETFs, right. yep. and mm -hmm. it got a lot of bad press, uh, rightly so. It wasn't that anyone was doing anything underhanded, but they're subject to the volatility of the market and volatile markets they do, don't perform as one might expect. They perform according to the prospectus but it's counterintuitive mm -hmm. and I came up with a way of constructing a, an ETF or a mutual fund that you could use, to, you could leverage an index and it would always maintain fidelity with the underlying index. So if the index was up, you were up by the amount of amount leverage. Of leverage. If it was down, you'd be down, but if it was neutral, you'd be neutral, whereas in the current funds, there's a, for typically they have a one-day period at which they're re-indexed. They'll maintain their 2x or 3x for one day, but after that all bets are off, and even if the market moves in the direction you anticipate, you could actually lose money just if there's a lot of volatility. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Th that's, that's impressive. Yeah. So, so we have probably about a minute left. Is there anything yeah. else you want to share with the viewers? Um, oh, uh, no, <laughs> not, not, nothing pr particular. Well, let's talk yeah. about this uh, FBI Apple mm -hmm. Fuhrer mm -hmm. and the uh, breaking into the phones. Uh, yeah. What What's your take on that? Well, I, th I think people, uh, the, the kind of common wisdom was, well, we want to stop terrorists, and no one will refute that. Uh, so there was a, there was a lot of people that I know at least you know thought well we should therefore you know make Apple do this, and what people don't realize is that if our government compels Apple to do it, other governments could do the same thing. I mean there's no reason Apple operates in China. Right. Apple mm -hmm. operates, I presume, in the Soviet Union or in Russia. It's now Russia. <laughs> uh, that they could make the same. They could try to compel the same thing and. There happen to be selling phones in a country that is our enemy. Uh, I'm not so sure that people would want that. As well, it creates a honeypot to attract hackers to get this very valuable technology. Once you've created it, you've got to store it somewhere. Right. So unfortunately, yeah. we probably have to end there. But I take it you were against it, obviously. <laughs> yes. So um, thank you. It was a great show. Um, please join us next week. Our special guest will be Dr. <coughs> Steven Sipser, CEO um, of Vision Lock. Um, he's going to talk about the advances in um, eye surgery um, to help you see better. So please join us. Your money matters. Thank you.